In this video, I will describe how to perform the surface landmark guided paramedian or paraspinous approach to lumbar puncture and spinal anesthesia. The main advantage of the paramedian or paraspinous approach is that it allows us to bypass narrowed interspinous spaces that make the midline approach difficult or impossible. Narrowed interspinous spaces are usually the result of degenerative spine disease, inadequate lumbar flexion, or both. A classic example of this is the elderly hip fracture patient. Because the aim is to merely bypass the interspinous space, the needle should be inserted very close to the spinous process. This is why I prefer the more descriptive term paraspinous to paramedian. As you will see, this vital step simplifies the three-dimensional triangulation process that causes most of the difficulty with this approach. There are four simple steps to a successful paraspinous approach, which will be illustrated here in this video of a junior resident performing it for his first time under my instruction. First, palpate the desired interspinous space, but more importantly, establish the superior border of the lower spinous process. Second, mark the needle insertion point at the superior edge of the lower spinous process and adjacent to its lateral edge. Infiltrate the skin and the underlying paraspinal muscle. I recommend exploring the contours of the spinous process with the local infiltration needle to further confirm the best trajectory. Third, insert the introducer or spinal needle at a 5 to 10 degree angle to the midline and with only a slight cranial angle. This will often contact the lamina on the first pass. If so, the fourth step is to withdraw and make incremental redirections in a cranial direction without changing the lateral to medial angle. This will walk the needle tip off the lamina and into the interlaminar space. Let's look at this step by step. Success with the paraspinous approach is greatly increased if you have a good mental model of the anatomy of the spine. Start by palpating the spinous processes with two fingers, rolling over the summit that is the tip into the valley of the interspinous space and back again. The feel of this is very similar to rolling two fingers over the knuckles of your other hand. Grasp or straddle the lower spinous process with the two fingers. Mark or note the superior margin of this spinous process as well as its lateral border. The needle insertion point is just inferior and lateral to the superior margin of the lower spinous process, which is roughly in line with your fingertip if your fingers are straddling the spinous process. The needle is inserted at a very small lateral to medial angle, no more than 5 to 10 degrees. The caudal to cranial angle should be even smaller to begin with. If the interlaminar space is large, for example in a well-flexed lumbar spine, then the needle may enter the space without any cranial angulation at all. Most of the time, however, it initially strikes the lamina of the lower vertebra. The needle should now be redirected in small increments, gradually increasing the cranial angle but maintaining the same lateral to medial angle. The needle tip will continue to make bony contact with the lamina, which feels like you are walking the needle tip up a wall. Contact is always at the same depth. Eventually, the needle walks off the edge of the lamina and slips into the interlaminar space. This is signaled by an ability to advance the needle deeper than during previous needle passes and the characteristic feel of the ligamentum flavum will be encountered. From here, it is a simple matter to enter the epidural or intrathecal space as desired.
If the lateral to medial angle is too large, the lateral aspect of the spinous process will be encountered. This is signaled by bony contact at a relatively shallow depth with initial and subsequent needle passes. It is actually helpful during the process of local anesthetic infiltration of skin and muscle to deliberately angle this needle medially and determine where the spinous process lies. This will set the limit for lateral to medial angulation, which should then not be exceeded. If the lateral to medial angle is too small, the needle may contact the facet joint rather than the lamina. This is signaled by bony contact that causes unilateral back pain. If the patient is in the lateral decubitus position, the principles and steps are the same. As a right-handed person with the patient in the right lateral decubitus position, I place the two fingers of my left hand on either side of the lower spinous process with my fingertips in line with the superior edge. The needle insertion point is just superior to my fingertip and in line with it, which also means it is adjacent to the lateral border of the spinous process. I recommend inserting the needle from the dependent side of the patient to allow gravity to help CSF backflow. The angles of insertion are the same and as previously stated, the needle tip usually contacts the lamina. It is then redirected cranially to walk into the interlaminar space. If the patient is in the left lateral decubitus position instead of the right, there is no difference in hand position, just that the two fingers are now straddling the upper spinous process rather than the lower one. This video illustrates the paraspinous approach in the lateral position. As before, palpate the upper and lower spinous processes bordering the chosen intervertebral space. Note that with experience, it is not essential to palpate and mark the skin prior to preparation, but when learning, it is helpful. The insertion site is lateral to the edge of the superior border of the lower spinous process. Anesthetize the skin and paraspinal muscles, and then use the local anesthetic infiltration needle to gather further information about the bony anatomy using tactile feedback. In particular, direct the needle medially to deliberately seek contact with the spinous process. This establishes the maximum limit of medial angulation. Fix the skin and exchange the infiltration needle for the introducer or spinal needle. With an introducer, I tend to only insert it halfway so that it can be easily manipulated to guide spinal needle redirection. The first pass usually results in bony contact, as we have discussed, which should not be painful as long as it is gentle. As explained previously, unilateral pain suggests that the needle needs to be angled in the more medial direction, and shallow bony contact means that it needs to be angled less medially. The needle should be redirected in small increments cranially until it walks off the lamina into the interlaminar space. And that's all there is to it. Practice will result in a kind of sixth sense about where to place your needle and how to redirect for maximum effectiveness. Here, however, are a few tips that may prove useful. You may have noticed in the preceding video that the patient was in a modified Sims position rather than a strictly lateral position. This position where the patient slants away from you a little bit is a more stable position that is particularly helpful in the obese patient. It also makes it easier to maneuver the needle when inserting it from the dependent side of the patient 
which would otherwise have a tendency to touch the bed, especially when using longer needles. Attention must be paid to the angle of the slope of the patient's back, however, as this will determine the correct needle trajectory relative to the horizontal plane. Because the spinous processes are such an important landmark, it must be realized that the tips of spinous processes aren't neat round circles. Instead, they have a definite height to them and so are more like rectangles. More than that, they are not uniformly wide at their upper and lower aspects, being shaped more like a pyramid. As the paraspinous approach involves inserting the needle alongside the spinous process, it is important to appreciate this transverse width. This is yet another reason why the two-finger palpation technique is so valuable. Here I am palpating the spinous processes of a patient in a lateral position and my two fingers are straddling the tip of the spinous process. In the image of the left, I am palpating the inferior border of the upper spinous process. And in the image on the right, I am palpating the superior border of the lower spinous process. Note the difference in distance between my two fingertips, which corresponds to the difference in width of the spinous process. And of course, in real patients, the shape of spinous processes are not regular. You can see though, that the pyramidal change in width of the spinous process still generally holds true. Note that age-related changes often result in the spinous processes and their tips becoming distorted and widened. I have found this to be particularly true in older people who have done a lot of heavy lifting over the years. This affects how lateral you have to insert your needle to bypass the tip of the spinous process, and consequently the lateral to medial angle will also vary. Where the spinous process is relatively narrow, the needle can be inserted at an angle that is almost perpendicular to the skin. If the spinous process is distorted and widened, then the insertion point has to be shifted more laterally to avoid the tip of the spinous process, and as a consequence, a greater lateral to medial angle will be needed to successfully enter the space. As mentioned before, Probing with a local anesthetic infiltration needle before inserting the actual spinal needle is very helpful in delineating the contours of the spinous process. In the obese patient, it goes without saying that the tips of the spinous processes are harder to palpate. Because of the increased amount of overlying soft tissue, they often feel wider and more diffuse in their contours. Compression of the soft tissues with the two palpating fingers often allows the spinous processes to be reached with the local infiltration needle, and this needle can be used to map out the location and contours of the tips of the spinous process by feel. Alternatively, ultrasound imaging can be used, and this is covered in more detail in another YouTube video. The needle should be inserted lateral to the perceived lateral border of the spinous process, but because of the overlying soft tissues, this may be more lateral than usual, and the lateral to medial angle may also be larger, closer to 10 to 15 degrees than 5 to 10 degrees. When bone is contacted, small careful redirections are essential to walk the needle off the lamina and into the interlaminar space. When employing the paraspinous approach in the scoliotic patient, the needle should be inserted on the convex side of the curve as the interlaminar space is widest there. Because the spine is already rotated, lateral to medial angulation is often minimal. Again, this is covered in more detail in another video specifically dealing with ultrasound imaging for neuraxial blockade in the scoliotic spine. Thanks for watching and you can follow the links to the other videos in the series on lumbar puncture and neuraxial blockade.